Hello. <laughs> so the title of my talk today is The Punishment Wars. So why The Punishment Wars? Well, to explain the work I do, I want to tell you a story. When I was six years old, I cheated. In many ways, I was the perfect cheat. I mean, look at that face, right? Innocence, vulnerability, not a hint of cunning or deception. So I was sitting next to this math genius um, in my class, and uh, I happened to look over and see that her answer was different than mine. And history had proved that she was usually correct, so I quickly erased my answer and entered hers. But then I was hooked. Within 10 seconds, I started doubting my own answers, and I, I just tried a little bit to shuffle closer to see if I could get another look. As it turned out, that shuffle was my fatal flaw. The teacher saw me, and with a loud cough, <clears throat> she ordered me to sit at another desk across the room. So I walked, I walked across the room, I was, I was humiliated. It was a death march, I had been caught. So oh, the first rule of cheating is never assume you're good at cheating. So why do we cheat? What does it feel like when we cheat and we get caught? What does it feel like when we cheat and we don't get caught? There was a great experiment done a few years ago where um, experimenters had subjects, and they were asked 10 questions. And they, the, the, the subjects had, it was a very hard test, and uh, they were supposed to write down their own answers um, and then grade themselves. And on average, when the people took the test, they got four questions correct. But then they took it further and they said, okay, after you take the test, rip up your piece of paper so there's no evidence whatsoever. And all of a sudden, people started getting seven questions correct. So the number went up. Now, to manipulate the situation even further, they had an actor who came into the, um, came into the room and stood up in record time minute or two, and said, I solved all the questions, uh, what do I do now? And it was obvious that he had cheated. Now, if that person was wearing, for instance, a collared t-shirt, or if they could somehow relate it was in the same social group, then it encouraged those people in that same social group to also cheat. So what we learned was that cheating is actually a social art. So in my lab, we're interested in cheating and punishment. We're interested in understanding the biological mechanisms, the evolutionary mechanisms that lead to cheating and punishment. Now, to understand where all this cheating comes from, you have to go all the way back to the beginning, to the origins of life. You see, cooperation, life itself, was built on, on, um, on, on cooperation. Cells, individual cells, cooperating together, evolving a division of labor, resulting in organisms that can breathe and walk and, and wear crazy hats. And what this means is actually pretty amazing. What it means is that all organisms on Earth, all organisms on Earth are involved either directly or indirectly with some sort of cooperative relationship. Every organism on Earth. So from the bees that pollinate our flowers for nectar to the tiny algal symbionts that power the world's oceans, all of these organisms, all of these relationships the mitochondria in our own cells, it's all built on cooperation. And everywhere we see, cooperation is ubiquitous. But, like all good science, there's something underlying this tension. And in this case, it's the idea that organisms are inherently selfish. Right? Organisms have been selected over millions of years through natural selection to put their own resources first. So why on earth would you share, why would you expend resources to benefit a partner when you could redirect those resources to one's own self? This is where we have the problem of cheaters. So let me illustrate an example by talking about the cleaner fish mutualism. But first, let me get a slokia of water. Much better. 
Okay, so here you have this mutualism where fish get covered with these ectoparasites, right? They're covered in these parasites, and this comes at a cost to their fitness. But you have these cleaner fish that have evolved to actually eat the ectoparasites off the fish. And of course, both parties benefit, right? You have the fish that's getting cleaned of the parasites, but at the same time, you have the cleaner fish that are um, uh, eating the parasites as a, as a source of food. So it seems like it should all work out. But imagine you're a cleaner fish, right? Imagine you're a cleaner fish, and you just decide to take a slightly bigger bite. Right, so not just the ectoparasite, but a bit of the flesh as well. And we all know how good sushi tastes, right? This is the freshest sushi you can get. So these cleaner fish, you can imagine that if they just take a bitter bite, there's all these advantages to cheating, right? They take a bit bigger bite of the flesh. And we see that there's this advantage, because instead of searching all of this time for parasites, they're actually able to get the resources they need in one single bite. So we see this, we see these clear advantages of cheating in nature. And actually, it just comes down to a simple cost-benefit analysis, right? When you think about it, it's the probability of being caught. Why, why should you cheat, right? If we look at this, we can just think of it as the probability of being caught, how much is actually gained if you get caught, and then what is the punishment if you get caught? And it comes down to a simple cost-benefit analysis. And in many cases, the best option is to defect from mutualistic cooperation. And so we can look at this in many different ways. This is a way of looking at it mathematically, where we just see, actually, if you're a cheat, it always pays to be in the minority. And as the proportion of cheats in a particular environment increases, then the benefits of being a cheat decrease. So you always want to be a cheat surrounded by cooperators. And so what we do in our lab is we study these types of dynamics in nature using a diversity of model systems. So we study plants and their microbes, for instance, with bacteria and their interactions with fungi. And we also study these interactions between plants and animals, like plants and pollinators and plants and ants. And what we see in all of these systems is that cheaters are out there. But the problem is, is it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult to find cheaters, right? Cheaters don't sit up there and say, I'm a cheater. That's, that's not their prerogative, right? They need to actually be a bit more deceptive. And so they can be really hard to find in nature. So instead of always consistently trying to find them, in many cases, what we do is we actually create the conflict ourselves. So we force the individuals to cheat. So we manipulate the levels of cooperation of these different partners. We force them to cheat, and then we test how the different partners respond. And through this work, we've discovered a, 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 a many, many sort of amazing mechanisms that plants use to control cheating. So I'm just going to walk you through a couple. For instance, take the mutualism between legumes and their nitrogen-fixing bacteria. Again, on paper, it looks like a perfect relationship, right? Legumes need nitrogen. Plants need nitrogen. And the atmosphere is full of nitrogen, but it's not in a form that the plant can use. So what they can do is partner up with bacteria that's actually able to break this triple bond that's very, very difficult to break in the atmosphere, and then put it in a form that they then feed to the plant. Now, in return for this, the bacteria are housed in these nodules in the roots and are able to reproduce. But we wanted to know what would happen, what would happen if the bacteria no longer provided nitrogen, if they defected from their mutualistic duties. So what we did was, rather than um, try to find these strains, we know that they're out there, but we wanted to force the level of cheating at a very specific scale. So we grew these nodules in an argon atmosphere, which is a, just a different uh, atmosphere than nitrogen, and the bacteria can't fix argon into nitrogen. So we forced them to defect because they didn't have the raw material that they needed to provide to the plant. So in this case, what we saw was that the bacteria defected, and the plants were able to detect this on an incredibly small scale, down to the level of an individual nodule. And what the plants did was they basically found the Achilles heel of the bacteria. You see, the bacteria need air, they need oxygen to grow, but as soon as they're in the nodules, the only oxygen they get is from the host. And so if they failed to provide nitrogen, the host would actually shut off the oxygen and suffocate the bacteria. 
Or take an example that we've been studying in the Okinawa Islands in Japan. Here you have a situation where you have a, a tropical tree, and it's only pollinated by a very, very specific moth. Now, this moth looks really big in this uh, picture, but actually it's only the size of my thumbnail. And it's very difficult to find. It only comes out at night. And, in, and the plant can only be pollinated by this one pollinator. And in exchange for pollination, the moth is allowed to lay eggs into the flower, which develop into larvae. But if the moth lays even just one too many eggs in the flower, the plant can sense it. The plant can sense it and then aborts that particular flower. Now, we're not talking about a small plant with just a few flowers. We're talking about a massive tropical tree covered with thousands of flowers. And it can sense down to the individual flower. Or take the case that we're working on in Africa, in Kenya, where you have a, a, a mutualism, a, a partnership between acacias and, uh, and ants. Now, these ants are incredible because what they do is they actually um, protect the acacia from herbivory. So if an animal, such as an elephant or a giraffe, comes and tries to eat the acacia, the ants, they swarm, even up the elephant's trunk. Now, the elephants just absolutely hate it, and they shake back and forth. Really, really dislike it. But what we found was there's this one species of ant that was a slacker. It was not aggressive. It was not good at fighting off the herbivores. So we tried to think, okay, is this one case, are we watching actually a case where the cheater is winning? But actually, what we found is if we studied this, we had just had to have patience. And what it looked like was that we were just studying it at the wrong time scale. You see, when conditions got really bad, and uh, it was a really bad rain year, for instance, all of the other really good, aggressive ants, they abandoned the tree. They simply abandoned the tree. And the only one that stayed behind was this so-called cheater. And having Having a, a less aggressive but still okay symbiont or partner is much better than having none at all. So when we started to look at a different time scale, we saw actually this isn't a cheater. This is a good symbiont if we look at it over much longer time scales. Now, when I, when I tell these stories, the science, the science actually seems pretty obvious now, right? I mean, you have this host, and it's exposed to all of these different partners, and the partners defect, but this, the host can sense it, right? These are partnerships that in many cases are millions of years old, sometimes hundreds of millions of years old. Of course the host has evolved ways to be able to discriminate among these partners and pick the good ones. So we started to ask a different question now. Does it ever work in the reverse? Can the small, can the small actually ever be powerful? Can there ever be what we're calling a tiny rebellion, where actually it's the partner that's influencing the host? So this is where we sort of had a change in what we were studying, and we started to understand we need to look at it from a different direction. And in doing so, actually one of the best places to try to understand how the small can be powerful is actually in our own bodies. So when we, when we think about what it is to be human, I mean, in, in fact, for every one human cell that we have, we have 10 microbial cells, right? So if you do a quick calculation, that just means that we're only about 10% human. What are all of those microbes doing? How do they influence the hosts? Basically, what it's saying is that we are in the minority. So who's in charge here? There's so much research coming out right now suggesting that these microbes have an incredible influence on our actions and our behaviors, and, th and, and especially for things like diseases. So in the last two to three years, we've been bombarded with these images of humans as just a, a shell, a shell for all of these microbes, right? And basically what's going on is it's the microbes that are controlling us. So the, the media has really gone wild, showing, ask, trying to make us ask all these interesting questions like, um, do humans actually have their own free will? And who is controlling our behavior? And in doing so, they're creating all of these really creepy pictures of humans covered in microbes. I think this one's particularly creepy because she only has one microbial leg and the other one seems to be, seems to be missing. But behind all of this hype about what it is to be a microbe or what it is to be human is actually some really interesting science. And that is, is that microbes 
can exert powerful behavior, can exert incredible control over our own behaviors. Now, one of the most extreme examples is um, a protozoa, right? I'll just walk you through a couple examples. A protozoa that infects the, uh, the brain of mice, and it changes their chemistry so that they're actually attracted to, to their predator, to cats. So it changes the chemistry so that the, the, the mouse is no longer, it loses its fear of cats, but rather is attracted to it. And this allows the protozoa to reproduce in its predator. Or take one of these really iconic examples of what's called the zombie ant. This is fantastic. You've got this ant and a fungal spore, a single, a single fungal spore germinates on the top of the head of this ant. And again, it changes the behavior of the ant so that they climb to the tallest possible um, leaf or tree in the area. Once they get to the top, the fungus actually germinates down, uses the body as a resource, as a nutrient source, and then grows the mushroom where it lets its spores fly. And of course, this mushroom has a huge advantage because it's letting the spores go from such a high height, so it can spread the spores much further. But it's even subtle changes, right? Those are all very, very dramatic cases. But for instance, take an example where um, they did an experiment with, dr with Drosophila, these fruit flies, and they just subtly changed the microbes in the guts of these Drosophila. And it made them choose different mates. Who they were attracted to changed. Just a slight change in the microbial composition, and they were attracted to different individuals. This is one of my favorite articles that came out recently in The New Yorker called The E. coli Made Me Do It. And basically what it's saying is that, yes, yes, we all know microbes are incredibly important for a whole series of diseases, right? We know that they're important for obesity and colon cancer, e even earwax. I didn't know that. But it goes on to say that a number ele of elegant studies suggest that the microbiome, the microbes that we carry, have a huge influence on our behavior. So it's not just about diseases, but it's how we behave. Now, if you think this is interesting for, for animals, right, and this is really where all the media focus has been, um, uh, most of the media has been focused on animals, it's even more intense for plants, right? And this is where we're coming in. So plants, it turns out, are only about 0.1% plant. There's, for every one plant cell, you have some between 100 or 1,000 different microbes. So plants really, in a sense, are only 1% chance. So how do these microbes influence plant behavior? Well, let's just take an example. Say you're a root system, and you need nutrients, and you want to take up nutrients, and you can form this partnership with a, fun with a, with a fungi. And in exchange for sugars, the fungus will collect nutrients and, and, and give you a much larger access to nutrients. So you say, okay, let's form this relationship. But what's interesting is that once the fungus actually begins to colonize the plant through this cunning molecular dialogue, it actually suppresses the plant's own ability to take up nutrients. So basically what it does is it restricts the plant directly from taking up nutrients, and it creates this chemical dependency. It's a bit like a drug addiction. All of a sudden, the plant needs those nutrients even more than it did before, yet it has to pay all of these sugars to get it. So it creates this dependency. So this is just one example of how microbes can actually manipulate, manipulate basic plant functions. But when you stop and think about it, right, a fungus, you can almost imagine it. It covers a root system. You can imagine how it could start to actually control plant behavior. But what about things like single bacterium? I mean, what happens? How can organisms like bacteria control? How do they begin to work together? Are there ways that these bacteria can actually collectively work together to begin to manipulate plant function? So there's been some really interesting work recently that has um, sort of opened up this field of what is called collective decision-making in microbes. And what the research is finding is that microbes, even at the level of individual cells, they've evolved ways to actually work together. And, and, and again, exhibit complex behaviors. For instance, we see that microbes, they're incredible at hunting in packs. They can jointly, together, scavenge for resources. They form these incredibly complex structures where some actually uh, give suicide to allow others uh, to reproduce. They collectively conserve resources. 
So this is all part of this field of what we're calling social microbiology, which is the study of these types of social organisms, such as conflict and cooperation in microbes. So over the years, we've, we've become really interested in trying to understand these collective behaviors. So I started digging through the old literature and trying to figure out when did these social behaviors, when did scientists start understanding that these social behaviors uh, existed? So I went and collected a bunch of different videos of the, of the first time people were actually understanding these collective behaviors. about these behaviors is that they're happening right now. All of these incredible microbial behaviors are happening right now under our feet. And we have, we're just touching the surface of trying to understand how they evolved, what made them evolve, and, uh, and just discovering new ones. I mean, for instance, the, the, the picture of the lasso with the horse, right? There are carnivorous, carnivorous fungi that have evolved these lassos, these loops, that actually grow in the soil and these nematodes, very small nematodes, get caught in these lassos. And once they're caught, then the fungus actually starts to digest the nematodes. So my lab is, trying to in is interested in these types of microbial strategies, these types of collective microbial strategies. And actually what we're, what we're particularly interested in these days is these special cases where you've got microbes that are actually trading with different partners with their host and other microbes in sort of a economic market type dynamic. So we're asking, how do microbes, can we look at microbes in these situations as actually as economic markets, as economic actors? Do they follow the laws of supply and demand? 
Are there ways to study microbial interactions, microbial trade, using an economic framework? So what we're trying to ask is, we, we see these microbes as economic actors, can they actually, can a microbe, can it evaluate? Is there some way that it's evolved to evaluate the potential of its partner? Can they sense the context of their decisions? For instance, if there's high nutrients, do they offer their nutrients at a lower price? Can they offer competitive pricing schemes? For instance, do they, can they sense what other competing microbes are around at that same time and offer, again, different prices depending on these contexts? So this is not a new idea. It's all under the heading of biological market theory, which was introduced in the early 1990s. And the theory was that these markets actually emerge in nature. I think the best uh, studied examples are between primates, where you've got a certain amount of food, for instance, being exchanged for a certain amount of grooming services. But as the food resources increase, the price of food goes down, you have to pay more for grooming services. But all of this past work on animal societies had this assumption. And that is that you needed some sort of complex reasoning to be able to bargain. You needed some sort of cognitive ability to be able to tell a good deal from a bad deal. But we're looking at it now from a totally different perspective. Now we're asking, actually, does cognition, does it actually undermine rational economic decisions. For instance, we know in humans that they're very bad at making optimal economic decisions. So do different notions such as fairness and inequity and having expectations, does that make you a poor economic actor? So there was a, an, a recent uh, experiment done by Franz Duval that looked at these kinds of questions and how um, notions, for instance, of inequity uh, affected uh, how trade was done. So there's a, a, a short clip I want to show you where a task that a capuchin monkey has to do is rewarded, but it's rewarded with unequal pay. And the thing that you need to know is that capuchin monkeys, they love grapes, but they, they like cucumbers okay, but they'd much prefer grapes. What we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side, and if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. If you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task, and we give her a piece of cucumber and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us, and that's what she does. And she gets a grape, and she eats it. The other one sees that, she gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> She tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to us. And she gets cucumber again. Now the point of showing this video is that microbe, right? A single microbe, it would never throw back the cucumber, right? It would never reject a resource in that kind of situation. Because what happens with microbial markets is that these terms of trade, they're actually explained solely by the current value of the potential partner and that actual context of exchange, right? So what that means is that these trades are based on immediate rewards and not anticipated benefits. And that changes how markets evolve. So we had this paper a few months back looking at these microbial markets in nature and asking, well, how often do they evolve and what causes them to evolve? And, um, and one of the, the model organisms that stood out as a really savvy economic trader was this, these fungi, these arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. And now we're using them as a model or as an organism to study microbial markets. So they're ideal to study markets because you have multiple partners on both sides of the interaction, right? Imagine you're below ground. You've got these really complex fungal networks. And you've got a single fungal individual that's connected to multiple host plants at the same time. So it can actually, it can actually discriminate, it can actually sense which plant is giving the most resources, and it can make an economic decision to give the most nutrients, for instance, phosphorus or nitrogen, back to that partner. 
So you see these kinds of markets evolve. And with AM fungi in particular, not only can they avoid bad trading partners, right? We do a bunch of experiments where we manipulate the levels of cooperations and we see that consistently these fungi are only giving their nutrients to high quality partners. So they're good at avoiding bad trading partners, but they also have this clever way of providing a diversity of services. So for instance, if phosphorus is not needed, they can provide nitrogen. They're good at protecting against pathogens. In some cases, one of the market strategies that they've evolved is to become indispensable, basically to, to make it so the plant cannot survive without them. Uh, one of the most fascinating things that they do that we're just starting to look under and, and understand now is how they actually hoard resources. They can take up, these fungi can take up, for example, phosphorus from the environment and then put it in an inaccessible form so the host no longer has access to it from the soil and then sell it back to the host at a better price once those nutrients are taken up. And of course, these fungi are competing against each other and there's some evidence that maybe they're actually trying to eliminate their competition so that they can retain a monopoly over the whole host. So it's an incredible time to be an evolutionary biologist because basically we're no longer technology limited. We can study these types of underground markets. We can ask all kinds of questions. How are deals broken? Are trading strategies flexible? What gives traders leverage? Can cheaters in these systems actually prosper? So we're starting an ambitious program in the fall. We're actually trying to use quantum dot technology um, to track these nutrients in real time in complex networks. So how that works is that uh, you've got these nanoparticles that you can attach to nutrients and these nanoparticles fluoresce. So you can actually follow them in real time through complex networks. So we no longer have to study these very simple trades uh, between two partners. We can have multiple fungi, multiple host plants, and even differently labeled multiple commodities. So you can see all types of movement in these uh, networks. Basically, what we're doing is these invisible markets, we can make the invisible visible. It's like magic, but instead it's science. Another thing that we're doing is we're trying to look at how microbes, individual microbes make decisions. And do hosts, do the hosts of these microbes, do they have any influence over their decision making? So here we're working with Tom Jamizu at Amalf to use microfluidic devices where an individual hyphae, right, and you can't even see it with the naked eye, an individual hyphae enters into these nutrient devices. And these devices allow us to manipulate the nutrient landscape on a micron scale. So basically it's a maze of different nutrients and we can track the way the fungus goes through the maze. Does it go left for nitrogen or right, or phosphor right for phosphorus? If we change the conditions for the host, does that change the way the microbe actually goes through the maze? So we can track these individual decisions. And so why would we, why would we be interested in something like this? Well, the idea is that you can actually try to extend the plant itself through this relationship. You can breed for what we're calling increased organismality where the host and the, and the symbiont are no longer in conflict, where the symbiont is actually following what the host needs. And b basically, we can try to do that. We can evolve these relationships so we can have all of the benefits of having a symbiont, even make it an organelle in an extreme case without all the conflict. Okay, so I just want to end by saying, I think microbes are the final frontier, right? And for many years, people have known that we need to be able to harness these microbes, right? It's incredibly important to use these microbes, for instance, in, in medicine, in agriculture, in industry, and in even design, right? Even, even in design, we're seeing things pop up like the Tower of Fungus, which is a MoMA installation, which unfortunately only looks about like this at, at this point. But we're seeing all of these radical innovations, but still, I think there's one thing, there's one glaring thing that we're missing here. And that's asking, how do, we get, how do we get the next generation of biologists interested in these questions? So we've got these biologists, right? How do we show them that these microbes, something that they can't even see with the naked eye, are important to care about them? One thing we can do is we can take them out into nature, right? And we can show them all of the incredible forms that microbes, I mean, what? Really, amazing, these things. This looks like straight out of an Ikea ad. But these are organisms. Why did they evolve these structures, right? Try to get them interested 
in, in nature and, the, and, and these types of microbes. This is one approach. Another approach, and we have to admit, right, it's 2015. So what if we took a two-pronged approach, right? We submit them to nature, but we also say, how can we make this cool? How can we actually make it real for the next generation? So working with Alex May in my lab group, we have designed a, a video game for, for young children to try to understand how they can harness microbes uh, for the benefit of themselves and plants. This is a small trailer from the video game. because it's so dramatic. And it's just the complete opposite of how science actually works, which is usually not very much drama at all. So the idea is to try to get these into schools, involve things like artists. They're working on, on making microbes more accessible to kids. And, and instead of wanting to always be race car drivers, we have kids that actually want to be microbiologists. So that's the end of my talk. Usually this is the really awkward part, um, because usually when you make a scientific talk, that's where you end and everybody claps. But this is a very special talk um, because, of, uh, because it's my orazzi, and, uh, and this is where you say the thank yous for, um, and I, it's, 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 an emo it's emotional, obviously, um, and I think it's particularly emotional uh, because I see so many loving faces, and it's great to see because uh, my family from America couldn't be here, so it's really nice to see these, these faces. So rather than trying to make it emotional, I tried to make it sort of a network diagram and keep it very uh, mathematical. So I wanted to say thank you to, uh, to FALW, to the rector, to the dean, for giving me this incredible opportunity to speak today and to show the kind of science that we can bring to the FU. Um, I want to thank Animal Ecology and Systems Ecology for an incredible amount of support over the years, especially to, to Nico and Jacinta and Reen and my dear office mate, Herman, who still claims that I got to where I was today because of his prayers. So thank you for that. Um, before I say my family far away, an uh, extra special shout out to my lab, all three of you out there. <laughs> We're doing great work. Um, my family far away because they were the ones that let me be incredibly filthy and barefoot and discover the dirt for myself. Um, to my friends who, who, who have over the years still allowed me to come to very hip design events and talk about soil and somehow that still ends up working out okay. Um, to my neighborhood who are my Dutch family away from home, uh, there's so many of you out there today. <laughs> it's, uh, it's really nice to have a, a family that I can count on. To Stu, who came all the way from uh, the UK, lover of hollyhocks, and, uh, and it's really fantastic to have him here. And lastly, to my family. So, um, Crash and, uh, and uh, Willa Fern, Crash Kears, and Linus A. Brockett uh, Kears, I always tease them, I say, um, you know, I made you, right? I made your little legs and I, I made it. I made your little ears and your little toes, but it's just a lie. They totally made me. So um, I'm grateful to that. And then of course, to my loving husband, um, who, uh, who, would have thought, who would have thought that a scientist and a poet could make life sing like the way we do. Um, so I just want to end with a quote from Kierkegaard. So as an evolutionary biologist, um, I like this quote because it says, science, life can only be understood when we think about it backwards, but it must be lived forwards, right? So here's to uh, living forwards. Thank you.